Welcome, everybody. I'm Chris. And I'm Erin. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old podcast days. Like podcast. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get going here. Um, and we will start with introduction. So first of all, project base, awesome. And we'll kind of dig into what exactly that's all about uh, as we go along here. Chris, I'm still seeing white screen. You are still seeing white screen. It was full screen, but it was white. I don't know if anybody else was seeing that. That's what I was seeing. I was too. Yeah, okay. Try it again. Now I'm seeing, oh, there you go. You got it? There it is. Now Wait. we got it. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jeff. No problem. All right, so I'm Chris Butler. I am, my current role is a instructional technology coach down here. I'm in Hood River County School District across the river from y'all. I spent, grew up in central Washington, grew up in Sunnyside and found my way to WSU, go Cougs. Got my first teaching gig in Prosser, was there for 17 years and then worked my way into the Richland School District. Got hired as a teacher, ELA teacher at Hanford High School and that's when Aaron and I first met and uh, from there I taught in the school in the classroom for two years there and then became an instructional technology coach there in the district and Aaron and I worked closely with that but I'll let Aaron kind of introduce herself. Yeah hi I'm Aaron. Um, I will I'll just I'll just give the full bio here like Chris said. Um, I grew up on the west side of Washington. I lived in Redmond uh, for 14 years and then in high school my family moved over to eastern Washington. So I kind of consider myself a Tri-Cities native. Um, I live in Richland now and I'm teaching at Hanford High School which is where I went to high school. So I'm teaching at my alma mater which is fun. Um, I did also teach in Oregon for quite a while. I lived down in southern Oregon um, for almost 10 years and taught middle school there um, and then uh, moved up here and primarily I'm teaching high school so that I can work with my uh, high school theater department, which is kind of my passion. Um, I've taught language arts, social studies. I do teach some theater now as well. And uh, Chris and I got hired the same year. We were kind of in competition for the same jobs and uh, we got hired the same year and quickly found that we had similar philosophies. So we started working together a lot and have had a great partnership. Yeah. So we want to start out by first acknowledging the situation that y'all were put in at the end of the year and how tough that was and how you responded and embraced what the reality was and you move forward and you learn from it. And we just want to say thank you to teachers. You guys are rock stars and artists and magicians and you do your thing every single day. We wanted to talk a little bit also about the fact that we kind of come from this from a secondary lens. Um, we're going to ask you to put on your teacher hat and think through the things we're talking about today from your lens. How can what we're talking about and walking you through, how can it really relate to your class, your students, your level, your subject matter? Um, and we'll give some some examples and that sort of thing, but obviously we can't give examples for every single thing. So we want you to think in terms of that. How is what Chris is saying right now or Aaron's were saying right now, how does that fit with what I actually do in my class with my kids and my level? We also want to talk a little bit about the structure just before we get going. If you were with, you were here last week for the Steve and Stefan show, hashtag Thursdays with Steve and Stefan, it's a thing, look it up. Uh, we, our format follows the same why, how, what that they talked about. Simon Sinek, start with the why. And it's not something that we did because they did that. It's just how we formed this process as we were working on it. And it just worked with our way of thinking. Why are we doing what we're doing? How do we do it? And then what are the tools to actually get it done? So that's kind of how it's broken up. Erin, anything to add before we move on? No, I think that was delightful. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay. Look at this slide the whole look time. At, oh, look at this slide. Okay. <laughs> so three years ago, I made a drastic life change and I decided that I wanted to downsize. I sold my townhome that I was living in, sold pretty much everything except what I needed. Bike, clothes, skis, 
paddleboard and I built out this adventure van. This is Stella. And when I decided I wanted to do this, it was a process to get there. But when I finally bought the van and jumped in and decided to build this, I had no idea what I was doing. I had followed on Instagram and social media, some different hashtag van life people. I had watched some full length documentaries about simplifying and, um, and that sort of lifestyle. I had read some blogs and some posts and that sort of thing, but I didn't know exactly how to go about doing this, but I knew I wanted to, I was passionate about doing this. So I got the van and I started the build. I pretty much jumped in and just started doing it without really knowing much about carpentry or how to build a van. So I accessed YouTube videos. I reached out to people that had already done it and said, hey, what worked? What didn't work? What'd you do here? What didn't you like about this? And I did that through social media and through websites. And even in person, I would run into somebody um, in a parking lot or a trailhead and they had a van and I would poke my head in like, hey, tell me about this. What'd you do? And then throughout the process, I built this van and I brought my dad in to help me and he had some carpentry experience. So he was sort of a mentor figure and we just did it. And we made a whole bunch of mistakes and we learned from those and we went back and said, okay, that bed frame is too, not gonna hold up to um, me climbing in every night. So how can I fix that? So I went back and watched YouTube videos, did some more research, just that whole iteration process. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, why is this dude talking about his van? Stay with me. There's a reason. This brings us to our idea of Project Base Awesome. So if you think about that process that I went through, this is kind of how we learn in real life. I, got, I was passionate about something. I wanted to learn how to do something. I wanted to actually go hands-on and build this project, but I didn't know exactly how to do it. So I did some research. I reached out to some experts and I did it and I messed up and I tried again and I did it and I messed up and I tried again. That's how learning actually happens. After that learning was done, after I actually built the van, then I started sharing my thoughts and my process with other people on social media. I created videos, I shared pictures, I did some writing about it. I talked to people at Trailheads when they came up to see my van. So I started to create this authentic experience with other people, sharing my learning with others. So if we think of the van as a project-based learning thing, then that kind of ties in that story with that. We want to talk about project-based awesome. And we first of all, another disclaimer, we are not the gold standard in project-based learning. We're two teachers who had specific curriculum that we were required by the school and the district to teach. And we wanted to do it in a way that we could create authentic learning experiences for students. We wanted to give them voice. We wanted to give them choice. We wanted to incorporate instructional technology and we wanted to use great teaching, good feedback, um, creating structures for students to be successful. So we, that was kind of the genesis of this project. How do we take, as a for instance, how do we take the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a required novel, which is awesome, great, one of my favorites, one of Aaron's favorites, I know, but how do we take that and not just by the end of this week, read chapters one through five, we're gonna take a quiz at the end of the week and you're gonna write a paper, five paragraph essay at the end of the book. How do we take that required learning and incorporate that into project-based learning using instructional technology and good teaching. And that's kind of how we came up with the idea of Project Based Awesome. So what is it? We wanna create authentic learning experiences for our students. We want them to have an authentic voice throughout the process. We want them to explore personal choice. We want them to experience multiple inputs throughout the process and create multiple outputs. And Aaron will talk a little bit about that in a second. And we wanted students to create for and share with a real world audience. You think about my van story. I did all that. I was passionate about something. I have my voice. I learned how to do it. 
I shared with others in the real world audience. So that's kind of why I tell that story at the beginning of this. It's a real world example of Project Based Awesome. So the why behind Project Based Awesome, the why is bringing world, real world meaning and interest to a unit of study. We could very well have just read To Kill a Mockingbird, answered quiz questions at the end of each week, written a five paragraph essay, but we didn't want to, we wanted to do better for our students. We wanted them, we wanted to provide pride of focus, not only for our, not only to the students, but also for them to work um, in the plan. And I'm sorry, sir, Aaron, I'm already in the driving questions. You're just jumping in, but yeah. I'm, but I'm ready. If you're ready for me to, do you want to, do you want to go? I will jump in. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, uh, we kind of we kind of came up with this. Uh, I don't know. It's like a little dorky, but fun name of project based awesome, uh, mostly because we just like the word awesome. So it has several different components, and we want to go over some of those components, and maybe some of them will help you in your teaching. Um, and we've been trying to think about how do these components apply to um, our new unique learning environment that might be happening at a distance at times. Um, so I'm going to start with the driving questions component, and uh, this component comes from project-based learning. So if you were to learn gold standard PBL from the Buck Institute, which is now called PBL Works, they would talk about driving questions. Um, and so that's something that Chris and I certainly advocate for people using. And I would say, um, if you're not already using driving questions in your classroom and you only took one thing away from this webinar, I would advocate for it to be this, uh, because this is a really good gateway entry point into transforming your classroom, or at least it was for me. Um, so the, the purpose of a driving question is to bring that real world meaning to a unit and to bring student interest to the unit. I would say the driving question, it's going to help you as the teacher, but it is for the students. Um, we know that students um, will attack the learning with more purpose when they know what that purpose is and the driving question helps to focus that. Um, and for you, the teacher, it's going to help provide focus to your planning work for a unit that you're trying to put together. Uh, because a driving question can help you um, pull in those resources that you want to use with your students and exclude the things that might be extraneous to that. And I'll share a little story about that in a minute. As far as how to create driving questions for your units of study, uh, I think the first, the first place to begin is by putting yourself in your student's mindset and start to get curious about what they're curious about. What big questions are they interested in? And in a second, I wanna talk about how I think those points of entry might be a little bit different for younger students than they are for older students. And I'll get to that on the next slide in a minute. Um, you may also need to bring um, your required texts or curriculum to this driving questions work. Um, when Chris and I worked together a lot, when we were teaching together, and then when Chris was a coach in my district, um, and we kept working together in that capacity, uh, we often started with, okay, we know that in 10th grade, they have to read these three books. So we need to develop units around these three books. So the driving question needs to bring some real world meaning and interest to this required canonical novel that my LA 10 students have to read. Um, so that may be something that you want to bring in. If you have a certain textbook that has to be used, then um, you want to you want to have that material in front of you when you're thinking about driving questions. I would say there is no magic formula for writing a driving question. Although if you search for driving questions on the internet, you will see lots of resources that will um, that will give you some formulaic um, starting points. But I think it's okay to just kind of barf them out of your brain and test them out with your students. Um, and you can search online. There's lots of good examples for all grade levels and all subject areas, but I would caution you to just make sure you vet them yourself. Um, you, you are the best expert on your students in your classroom. And so um, if, if an essential question that you find for your grade level and subject area doesn't quite ring true for you, use it as a jumping off point. So Chris, go ahead and take me to um, the next slide here. Um, I'll go over some examples in a minute, but I wanted to bring another resource to your attention here that I've started using in the last few years when developing questions for and with my students. And that is I've come across the question formulation technique, which is um, the brainchild of the Right Question Institute. And I've put their website up there on the slide, rightquestion.org. 
Um, and they, they've also put out a book that's called Make Just One Change that is all about this topic. But this would be kind of leveling up on the how of building driving questions, um, is that you can bring more student choice into this process um, by guiding students through this question formulation technique to form their own driving questions for their work. Um, this works really well when your curriculum is super open-ended. I've been teaching a course the last few years called International Problems, and there isn't really a required curriculum for the course other than we need to study topics that fit under that course title. And so I've um, implemented a lot of student choice in that class, and we have frequently used this technique for students to uh, choose an international problems topic of interest to them and then use this technique to brainstorm and refine uh, meaningful, important questions to guide their work in their topic. Um, if your students need to produce a certain product, um, I, again, I'm thinking of my language arts lens right now, like let's say they need to write a particular type of essay, you could use the question formulation technique to uh, give a broader topic like issues in our community and then help students brainstorm their own driving questions to help them um, help guide their work around their essay. So if you haven't encountered this work before, I highly encourage you to do so. I've seen people use it even as young as primary grades um, with some modifications, of course, given those students um, nascent skills in reading and writing. But I've, I've seen teachers use it as young as I think first and second grade. So I think it is a strategy that can apply um, across the board. And now I'm ready for my next one, Chris. Gotcha. So I, I'm going, um, I'm going on a little bit about this topic, so I will try to keep it brief here, but I put a few examples up here and I think there's a couple of buckets you can put driving questions in. On the left, I have examples of questions that explore a philosophical issue. And on the right, I have questions that specify a problem to be solved. And this is where I wanna to return to this idea that different age groups of students may respond better to different types of questions. Um, I think with younger students, these questions on the right hand side, something more in that vein um, might appeal to them more and help keep them a bit more focused on whatever the task is at hand. Um, a lot of the project based learning materials that you'll see for younger students are um, are even more specific. They, they specify a certain product for students to create, like how can we use a podcast to teach people about the history of our community? That's a, that's a more narrow uh, project-based question, a more narrow driving question. Um, when Chris and I have worked with driving questions, we haven't gone that specific because we've wanted to offer more student choice, but we have worked primarily with high school students. High school students, I think, are probably more engaged, um, typically speaking, by the questions that are more like um, the ones on the left, where these are the types of topics that high schoolers middle schoolers want to grapple with, want to talk about, are thinking about. Um, they're a bit more complex. They're quite a bit more open-ended. And um, they're the types of questions they can talk with other adults about, which typically I find secondary students like to engage with. So that's just a little thought for you. It doesn't mean that you can't address a philosophical question with younger students. And it doesn't mean that you can't do a more concrete driving question with older students. It's just, those are my two cents. The link that's at the bottom of this slide, uh, PBL Works, which was formerly called the Buck Institute, they have a million billion resources on really high quality project-based learning. Um, and this particular URL takes you to, they've developed these project cards um, across all different grade levels and all different disciplines um, that could give you some really good examples of driving questions and framing up a project for students. It's not going to give you an entire unit's worth of materials, but it is going to give you some frameworks to start with. Okay. Um, yeah, I think given time, I don't want to step on Chris's time too much. So I'm going to move on to inputs and outputs, Chris. Um, okay, so this, this idea of inputs and outputs, I think is somewhat unique to um, to our framing of how we work with project-based learning. And um, Chris and I came to this approach because we were both kind of beating our heads against the wall of the required curriculum uh, because we wanted to be professionals and teach what was assigned to us to teach. And we also wanted to bring a bit more authenticity to students' experience than just read the novel, 
answer some questions, take a test, like what Chris was talking about earlier. And so uh, we came up with this idea of having a myriad, you know, myriad inputs and myriad outputs in any given unit. Um, and the why of that is that we think students should be taking in a variety of texts, not just one novel or not just one science textbook that tells you everything about a topic, but that there's a variety of, of different types of media um, and that they're getting different perspectives, different takes on what they're learning. And we also believe that students should be producing a variety of texts um, that certainly we're probably going to ask them to create one or two larger pieces per unit, but that we also want them to be producing shorter form work to help them process their thinking throughout the way. And I want to clarify that the word text in this instance does not necessarily mean written. So uh, we're also talking about things like um, video and audio, different various kinds of multimedia, infographics, any of those things could be used as inputs for students to consume and think about and also outputs for students to create. Um, so inputs and outputs, um, when we are planning a project-based awesome unit, uh, we would always develop the driving question first because that helps us isolate um, what inputs would fit. What types of sources do we want our students consuming to gather knowledge and start thinking about the topic? So I would definitely say uh, always have your driving question in mind before you go through this part of the process. Um, you need to think about your required curriculum, uh, whether that's required text that student needs, students need to interact with, and that also may mean required student products. Uh, for us in language arts at my high school, students have to write certain types of pieces. Um, that's true in our social studies department as well. Um, and then you want to start thinking about supplemental texts. And if your students are going to uh, create a certain type of product, then you want to be thinking about mentor texts. So if they're going to create a podcast as their end result, then you want to think about some mentor podcast episodes they can listen to to draw a technique from. Uh, generally speaking, when we plan a unit, we think about one larger input and several shorter ones and one larger output that students will create and several shorter ones. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, yeah, so this is what it would look like when Chris and I were brainstorming together to create a unit. So what you're seeing is a picture from my classroom several years ago. And this is when we were trying to plan an effective unit to teach the novel Fahrenheit 451, which is um, it's a great book. But it's a bit challenging. And so in the center, I know um, it's Chris's excited brainstorm handwriting, but I think it's pretty readable. So in the center was our draft of a driving question. How does technology impact society? Uh, because that was one of the things that Ray Bradbury was trying to explore in his novel. Um, and then around that in this kind of messy mind map that we have, you can see long text, short text, um, a little area on the left that says short written outputs, long written outputs, discussion topics, digital inputs, and digital Just, outputs. And Chris will be talking okay, about brainstorming would look, oh, are you guys cool? We're good. We're good now. You just froze for a second. You're perfect. <laughs> You're good. Keep going. My internet does that at times. So sorry. Right. That's all right. Keep okay. going. Um, and then um, why don't we show the next slide too, Chris? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Oh, there it is. Okay, so then this picture is from um, a coaching session that Chris did with another teacher in our district. This is a middle school teacher in our district. Um, and so this was how he and this teacher digitized this brainstorming and planning work. They, had, they made a central column for the driving question so that it would always sit in the middle of their planning document. And then they made that left column for all the different types of inputs they wanted to include and the right hand column for all the different types of outputs that they wanted to include. Um, in terms of, um, I, wanna, I wanna add a little bit, some, a little something else. When you're thinking about inputs, this is a place where you can incorporate more student choice. Uh, which is something Chris and I would always advocate for. So if you have like one larger required text that every student is going to interact with, think about how you can incorporate student choice into those smaller inputs, into those other pieces of media or other texts that they're going to be looking at. Could there be some kind of choice menu of 
inputs that students can choose from. Some students may prefer video, some students may prefer written, some students may prefer audio, or maybe you're going to ask them to choose from a smattering of those different types of input. Um, this would also be a good place um, for some asynchronous video from the teacher, especially if you're working in a distance learning environment. Um, a lot of us are thinking about perhaps hybrid learning environments for the fall. I know uh, many, many of you may have been read that came out today even. Um, and so this would be a good place, I think, for um, asynchronous video from the teacher. You could um, easily make short, really short bite-sized um, mini lesson videos to go with those inputs to help students digest them and process them. Um, and then on the output side, um, for those smaller outputs that you're thinking of, the, I would think of that like formative assessment. What are the things that the students are going to do throughout the unit to show their thinking and to show their learning as they're processing what they're taking in? Um, so often for us, the, the smaller outputs would be things like notes on their reading. Um, we would have usually like weekly class or small group discussions on the materials that students were encountering. Um, informal writing responses would be another great um, small output and you would you know you would adjust those by subject area of course but i think any of the things that i just mentioned could really be used in a lot of different subject areas um, discussions and formative writings certainly not just for ela or social studies um, for the well actually i'm gonna let's see how are we doing on time okay we're a tiny bit behind our little schedule here so um, I'm actually going to hand it off to Chris because Chris is going to talk next about authentic tasks, um, which is going to dovetail nicely with this idea of what is the big output that students are going to be creating in your unit. So I'm handing it back over to you, Chris. So before we move on to that, I just want to show this real quick. This is just a an example calendar that we built. So if you're thinking of in terms of inputs and outputs in this process uh, for next year and we're maybe blended, maybe distance, maybe in, in brick and mortar. If we think of a drop day on a Monday and office hours throughout the week and then turning stuff in on a Friday, you can kind of take this idea, drop it into a calendar like this and create that process, create that schedule. Thank you. So in the task, we're going to step into the Wayback Machine. And down on the lower left, you see a 1981 Chevy Citation. This was actually my, this not, not this one, but this was my first car. Um, and who didn't have a Casio watch with the calculator on it when they were a kid? So let's think about how the world has changed, right? So that was back in the day. On the right hand side, you've got an Apple watch, which is plugged in all the time. You've got a Tesla running on battery and plugged in and all these different things. But if you look in the middle, ah, ah, I'm just gonna leave that thought with you. Those, that's, you know, what does our classroom look like? We have the ability now to create authentic tasks and connect with authentic audiences. So the next two set, talk, uh, sections I'm gonna talk about, the authentic tasks and the technology, they kind of go hand in hand because I'm gonna talk about the technology it lends the ability for us to create these authentic tasks and for students to connect with real world audiences. So how do we do this? We have a series of questions that we like to think about when we're, when we're coming up with this, these ideas of what students can do for these authentic learning experiences. How does this type of task exist? Does this type of task exist, exist in the real world? Is it something that adults do? Is it something that happens in the real world? Who are the, the students creating it for? Are they just creating it for me, the teacher? Are they creating it for a school-wide audience? A audience outside of the school walls? How can I take more traditional academic task and bring it into the real world? Okay, we kind of talked about that idea of the fact that the reality is we have specific things that as teachers we are required to teach. How can we make that more authentic? for our students? And how can I extend the reach of my students' work? So for the what, uh, we talked about school and community projects, um, cross-curricular activities, video creation, blogs, podcasts, social media, and 
guest speakers, for goodness sake, let's talk about bringing guest speakers in, especially now if we're thinking about distance or hybrid learning for next year, why not have Zoom guests as guest speakers? I know some teachers have been doing that in their office hours. It's been really cool. Um, I want to step back a little bit and talk about some, some specific examples from my career as a student. In seventh grade, we did in a humanities course, kind of an English social studies hybrid class. We did what was called the Big Dig. So the Big Dig was where last year's students buried artifacts things that they made or found or created and they buried them in the back behind the portable and then the next spring next year's class would dig up those artifacts and they would kind of do a sociological like who were these people and what were they all about and that sort of thing it was an amazing project super cool but how much better can we make that today if we do the big dig and we bring in a actual archaeologist, a guest speaker, a Zoom person to talk to us um, and to share what that's really like. How about if the students, instead of just digging up and writing down their thoughts, they create videos and they create a website and they share that out with the world to learn about what they're doing. They could create podcasts talking about the learning that they're doing through this process of the Big Dig. So really cool project, but those tweaks, those adaptations that we can make now are so powerful to create those real learning experiences and real world audiences for students. Another one in fifth grade, my teacher did trials. So he had um, a person on trial, he had a judge, he had the lawyers and the jury and, um, and the, te the students had to act that out. How cool would it be now to bring in trial lawyers to talk to your students in a Zoom meeting, um, to videotape and share the process through social media and blogs and podcasts to talk about the learning. So those are ways to take these ideas that were really great even back in the day. That's why I showed you the 1981 Chevy Citation in my seventh grade and fifth grade years, and we could just tweak those. So think about what are some things I'm doing right now or have done that I could just tweak a little bit to add in more authentic tasks, real world audiences, things for the students to do. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Take what you're doing and just make little shifts. We, some things to think about with technology and with, like I said, the technology and the authentic tasks and audiences, they kind of fit together, right? So we live in a connected world it's technology is always at our finger fingertips. I don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to do some technology today. I wake up and I tell my smart speaker, I ask my smart, smart speaker to what's the weather today? Read the news to me. I get on my, my phone and I check Twitter and I post to my social media and I maybe do a, a FaceTime chat with my mom and maybe I'm planning a trip, um, this summer, probably not this summer, but maybe planning a trip around the country and I want to map out different spots and I want to do some research into those different spots so I can create a map on my device about where I'm going to stop and I can go onto YouTube and find specific videos about different towns or I can go onto different sites to find restaurants that I want to visit when I'm there. So this whole idea about technology and real world and authentic, it's, it's just what we do. It shouldn't be something in addition to what we do, right? So it's a quote that really sticks out with me. This was the keynote speaker two years ago at IPDX conference down here in Portland, said the world is handing you a curriculum. What are you going to do with it? The world's handing you a curriculum. What are you gonna do with it? We have so much information at our fingertips. What are you gonna do with that information? How are you gonna take what you're required to teach, the standards that you want the, that the students need to reach, but also incorporate those authentic real world audiences and pieces and technology is the vehicle that allows you to do that. So let's talk about how with technology, we want it to be a seamless piece of daily learning. Now, does that mean they're on their device all the time? No, that's crazy talk. We, we don't want them to be on the device all the time, but we want it to be available to them I have my phone with me 
all the time, right? It's available to me all the time. If I need to look something up or research something or send a message, I can do that at a moment's notice. So we want it to be a seamless piece of daily learning. We want students to be creators more than consumers. When I go back and talk about my van story, I consumed a whole bunch of information at when I first started out, watching videos, reading blogs, talking to people, but then I created this piece and the van, this, this big piece of work, right? And then I shared that with others. So creators more than consumers. And we want students to use technology in multiple ways through multiple platforms and mediums to show their learning in ways that they never could have before. So if you look at the right, and some of you I'm sure are familiar with the SAMR model, but as we move from enhancement to transformation, the enhancement is we're kind of taking the same thing that we used to do and we're just tweaking it and making it a little bit better using technology. Um, think about in your classroom where we used to have overhead projectors, um, then we had doc cams, some of us are now using iPads and just using it as a video picture basically projecting up on the screen. That's a substitution augmentation. The real magic happens when we move up to transformation, the modification and redefinition. I love this story. Jeff, I'm going to steal your story that you share when you were walking through a class with some ad administrators and a student was on his device. And correct me if I get this wrong, I might misquote you. Um, but a student was on his device. And you, the question that you ask is for redefinition, are you able to do what you're doing without your computer, without technology? So you ask the student, what do you, what do you, you kind of took their laptop away from them and said, what are you doing? Would you be able to do this without the laptop? And the student said, uh, actually, no, I'm about to have a, a video chat with, was it NASA uh, astronauts in the space station? Right? So think about that. That's a redefinition. There's no way you could have done that before. If I think about my big dig back in seventh grade, cool project, but we couldn't have zoomed in an archeologist to talk about what archeology span is really like. Right, that's the redefinition piece. That's where we, we want to get to. You're not going to live there, but that's where the the really important learning and, and change happens. So what? And again, we can't give you everything. There's no way we can list every single thing you can do. But there, these are some ideas. Shared collaborative documents. We are big believers in collaboration and communication between students, between teachers, all that thing. And you can do that with shared collaborative documents. Screen class, screencasting, Flipgrid videos to explain a process. And this can be done, uh, any grade level can do this. I love Flipgrid with the littles. They're so cute when they talk about their learning and they share their process. But I've seen it done with seniors and they rock. I've seen it done with adults and, and they're amazing at it, right? So it can be done with any grade level. Um, creating videos, images, GIFs to explore or explain a topic. Podcasts. Uh, I worked with a teacher in the Richland School District, um, Colin Gibbs, and we did have the students create podcasts and not just one podcast, but it was a series of podcasts instead of a quiz or a written piece at the end of the week. The podcast was that it was their learning over the course of the week about a specific topic. And then they did a podcast each Friday. And then at the end of the unit, they did one big podcast to talk about their learning throughout the whole unit to kind of synthesize all of their learning. Awesome. Ted talks, mapping out a character journey on Google earth from a, from a novel or a book corresponding with an expert in the field. Okay, again, just lots of different ideas, lots of different things you can do with technology. And you'll notice these are all in some way creating authentic learning experiences, creating chance for uh, an opportunity for student voice, creating opportunities for collaboration, creation. So that's kind of where we land with technology. Um, how cool would it be, how am I doing on time? for high school and elementary schools in the same district or even separate districts to have pen pals or Zoom pals. I don't know what you call them, Zoom pals, right? So you have same, same driving question, different complexities, but my elementary kids are working on this project about this driving question 
same as the high school kids, and they're getting together on a weekly basis or semi-weekly basis and talking about their learning that they're going through. How cool would that be? I just, there's so many different cool things that we can do to create authentic audiences and share these things with different kids utilizing the technology. All right. Um, I'm sorry, Aaron, before, before I don't want to stop any shows before I, we move on to power standards. One thing that I want to talk about, there's three powerful words that we can use as, as, as an educator, but they're really, really scary for us. I don't know. So I think back about a project that I did uh, with in, when I was in Prosser and the kids, it was a service learning project. They went out into the community and they had to contact businesses and one contacted a hospital because they wanted to buy, collect stuffed animals and deliver those to um, critically ill kids in the hospital and they did it. And to get that started, they needed to figure out who they needed to contact at the hospital and how they needed to do that. And they asked me and I said, I don't know. I honestly don't know, but that puts the power in their hands. That, that helps kids feel empowered and they need to go through that process of learning. That can be scary for educators. We all know that, but those are three powerful words. Okay. All right, sorry, Aaron. It's all good. Um, <laughs> so I wanna do a little bit of recapping. Um, in, in my unit planning process, I would usually start with, what is it that I need to be teaching? I'd come up with a driving question. I'd brainstorm those inputs and outputs like that big messy mind map. You saw the picture of the whiteboard with the mind map on it. Be thinking about what that end task is going to be and how we're going to bring some authenticity to it and what kind of audience it's going to have. And we'd be thinking about um, what pieces of technology do we want to incorporate that best serve the learning during throughout the unit and then in the creation of that final output and in putting it out to um, a broader audience than just the classroom. And then in the planning process, this is usually about the time when I'd say, wait, what standards am I covering in this unit? I know that we are all supposed to start with standards and sometimes I do remember to do that. But sometimes what I'm thinking is, okay, I gotta teach to kill a mockingbird. What am I gonna do with to kill a mockingbird? Um, so this is where we're inserting this little blip about power standards. I am sh sure that many, if not most, if not everyone in the webinar today has done some work with power standards. I would say most districts have tackled this work at some point, so I'm not going to belabor this. Um, just, uh, just to reiterate that having a set of power standards can help focus us again, uh, just like the driving question focuses us. So um, of course, if you haven't worked with power standards before, you're taking your massive list of standards for your subject area and your grade level, and you're paring them down to the most essential, and you're doing that based on utility, what will serve your students best in the future. Um, so um, when you have your list of power standards, um, as far as how that fits into project-based awesome, you need to think about two things. One is which standards are you going to assess during the unit? And to me, that means what's going to end up being assessed as part of that final outcome, that final output that students will create. And then um, plan backwards from there to think about, okay, how can students practice the skills in those standards throughout the unit before reaching that culminating task? Um, go ahead on to the next slide, Chris. Maybe, there it is. So if That's you're right. interested yeah. in digging Just... more into this work, like you haven't done it before or your district hasn't done it before, um, I recommend the book on the left there um, by Larry Ainsworth. He's done a lot of work around power standards. Um, so that's one that I've used in the past, but there are tons out there. On the right is a graphic that represents the power standards that Chris and I narrowed down for um, ninth and 10th grade language arts. So these come from the common core language arts standards. Um, and this was how we pared those down for one year of instruction in language arts. Um, these were the ones that we made sure we addressed at some point throughout the year in depth. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So um, jumping into the topic of assessment, um, we wanted to highlight in this section, you know, there's a lot of different great ways to assess, assess student work, but we wanted to highlight for people um, one called the single point rubric. So on the screen right now, 
this is the type of rubric that I always used to use. Um, this one is a little bit geared more towards elementary. Um, you would have several different criteria down the left there, and then across the top, you have um, the different levels of proficiency, and there's a descriptor in each box. Um, go ahead and click ahead one more, Chris. Here's an example of um, a high school typical rubric that you would see. There's a ton of text in this rubric, lots of specific descriptions. Um, and I used to use rubrics that looked like this. And I often found myself either Google searching for one that I thought was closest to what I wanted for my students. Or if I was writing my own rubric, I would find myself spending all this time trying to search for adjectives that would help delineate the different levels of performance. So maybe a proficient essay would have a clear thesis and an exceeding standards essay would have an exceptionally clear <laughs> thesis. And then I would find myself not really knowing how to explain that to students. They, the, the rubric was supposed to quantify things for them, but it didn't actually explain to them what the difference was between a clear thesis and an exceptionally clear thesis. So then I had done all this work creating a really detailed rubric that didn't ultimately necessarily produce better results in my students' work. Um, so, uh, yeah, so perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the reason that we use rubrics is that when assessing complex student work, um, something that is not a multiple choice or true-false exam, um, it allows for a more objective and equitable evaluation of student work. So even if you are giving exams, um, most of us who give exams have some kind of free form response included in an exam. And rubrics are useful even there, even for evaluating those short answer essay questions on exams and things like that. Um, why use the single point rubric is because that traditional rubric has some flaws as I, um, as I described when we looked at those um, previous pictures. So um, why don't you click one more time, Chris, and then I think I have an example of a single point rubric. Okay, so this is what a single point rubric can look like. Um, on the bottom left of the screen, you'll see the link to Jen, Gonz Jen Gonzalez's Cult of Pedagogy website, and I know that Jeff put it in the chat. Um, she is maybe not the original creator of the single point rubric, but she writes really, really well about it, and she's promoted it a lot um, in the ed education space. So I would recommend her website. She has a lot of good writing about it. Here is the, the image that you're seeing on the screen is from um, a rubric that I made. If I were going to criticize my own rubric, um, this is one from a few years ago, I would say that the, um, the language on the rubric, uh, the language of the standards on the rubric is not the most student friendly language I've ever written for students to look at. The concept of the single point rubric is uh, generally you have three columns. The center column is the standards, or if you wanna call the center column, here's what proficiency looks like for the students or for younger students. Perhaps you wanna call the center column, you know, right on target or something like that. Um, then the left column becomes um, a column to record feedback for students on each standard for which they didn't quite meet that criterion. Um, and this, allows you plenty of space to write and record feedback for them about specific areas. On the right hand side, um, I've always used that column for some kind of notation of here's where you went above and beyond the standard. Yes, you did everything in the standard and here's where I saw even more complexity than what's required of you at your grade level. Um, things that I like about the single point rubric is Number one, rather than me having this um, big piece of paper with a bunch of boxes filled in with a lot of text, what, how I would normally use the traditional rubric is that I would be looking at student work and then I'd go through and I'd just like circle the box for each criterion that seemed the closest to what that kid did. What this single point rubric prompts me as the teacher to do is give a lot more qualitative feedback to the student and it's much more personalized. Um, if you're thinking about one, one trick with rubrics can be, okay, but I teach in a school system, I have to convert this into a grade. And so if it's helpful for you to think about grades, um, I typically, when I, when I used this rubric to um, grade my students' work, I typically thought of that center proficient on standard column as a B in my grade book. And if students were able to um, reach above the standard, um, I told them that that represented an A, and then if they were below that, that that usually represented a C. 
Um, I don't know if that's helpful to anybody, but sometimes we have to translate ideal practices into the traditional gradebook world. Um, okay, next click. Um, maybe click one more time. Okay. Um, so here's another example of maybe a single point rubric, something that could work for younger grades. These are some um, learning targets or standards for like a science project where students have to go through the scientific method and do some kind of um, experiment, kind of like what you would do for a science fair. So I kind of relabeled the column, something to work on, meeting the target above and beyond because elementary students could certainly understand those terms. And this is a better example of a rubric that has some pretty student friendly language in it. Certainly younger students would be learning words like procedure and data and observations as part of their science studies. So I think it's um, good to leave those in there and it's pretty comprehensible. Um, and then why don't you move on to the next one, Chris? Okay, I know this is tiny, but um, I think Jeff also dropped the link to our slide deck in the chat. So maybe you can see it larger in another, on another screen. But um, this is an example of how I actually used the rubric with um, a student. So the red text on that image is my feedback to the student. So first of all, um, I most often use these rubrics digitally. Like I might hand out a paper copy to students in class so that they could kind of see it in front of their face while they were working. But then when they turned in their work, I would um, use a digital copy of the rubric to provide them feedback because I'm a much faster typist than I am a handwriter. And you can see that this student reached the standard, met the criteria for two of the criteria, and then they exceeded and went above and beyond on two, the other two criteria. And I actually wrote feedback in all four places um, because it was a, this was a, quite a large project and I really wanted to give them solid feedback on every aspect. Um, and when you're um, able to use digital rubrics, it doesn't take as long as you think it would to type this amount of feedback for a student. And then one more click, Chris. This is one variation, um, and this is also from Jennifer Gonzalez at Cult of Pedagogy. Um, so in this version, the criteria or the standards are in that far left column. And this, um, if you're not comfortable with the idea of just having kind of one column where you're rating student work, this can give you the ability to still use that four point scale if you've already been using rubrics in the past, but it does eliminate the need to write detailed descriptions of every criterion at every level of proficiency. Um, I've used this one a lot in my theater classes actually for student performances. So I'll have the criteria for their performance in that far left column. And then I'll mark where in that scale of one to four, I felt that they were in each of those aspects. And then I'll write a piece of feedback about each as aspect on the right. Um, so that's kind of a variation on the single point rubric that might be helpful to you in evaluating these beautiful authentic tasks that you're going to ask your students to do. Anything to add on rubrics, Chris? Nope. Nope, okay. you nailed it, Aaron. Okay. As I knew you would. <laughs> so this is just, so this on your screen, <laughs> this is a visual, this is a flow chart, if you will, that we created when we created the project base. Awesome. I know it can look busy, but notice some things. Driving question is right at the heart of the matter. It's always in the middle of everything and everything ties back to the driving question. One thing that we were, when we started adopting this way of, teaching and creating units. If something, no matter, even if it was a really cool idea or a project or a piece of text or an input or an output, if it didn't tie in with the driving question, it was tossed out. That, that it was a harsh thing that we had to do sometimes, but that it, everything needed to tie to that driving question. Um, you can see sound pedagogical practice, good teaching, instructional technology, the inputs and the outputs, and they kind of flow from one to another. So that's just a visual that you can dig into if you'd like to. And that is kind of project-based awesome in a nutshell. So questions, questions and answers, and then we have some things to take care of at the very end here. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys. Um, there aren't a lot of questions. It's been pretty silent over in the chat today. I, wow. People are just in awe. I think <laughs> I don't know what's yeah. going on. The chat's usually going to my, I love I love the I love the focus on the rubrics because I think that's a lot of times, you know, we've been doing rubrics um, the same way for a long time in education. And I love the idea of this single point or single column rubric. I think it allows, and to your point, that idea of feedback. 
Um, it just allows you so much more room for feedback than going through some kind of, and I, to your point, Aaron, like I was, I was the rubric king back in the day and I spent hours wordsmithing those stupid things. You know, I love the simplicity of it. Um, just like, oh my gosh, that is just incredible. Um, so here's one question we got in. Uh, can you speak to some specifics of how you would use PBA during a distance learning model? So if we were in some kind of distance learning model, how do you see this project-based awesome or what would this look like when you have kids like maybe in this every other day format, AB format, or you see kids for a week, you don't see them for a week. How do you see a model like this uh, really supporting teachers in, in that kind of model of learning that we could be looking at? So I'll address my thoughts on that. I think it fits yeah, wonderfully with it, to be honest. And, and here's why. So if I think of the idea, the schedule of dropping a drop day on a Monday, like we've talked about in Reimagine, right? Drop day on a Monday, office hours mm -hmm. throughout the week, work turned in on Friday, another drop day on a Monday. If you think of the calendar that we shared with you um, and we're creating inputs for the students to learn from, those can be dropped on the Monday. So if I'm creating mm -hmm. videos as a teacher, I drop those on a Monday, I provide text, I say, you need to read these chapters. And then, and then throughout the week, the project, that's, that's, they're working on that. It can be hands-on work that they're doing. Um, they don't necessarily need me for that, but they can come back and ask me questions. Hey, I'm really struggling with this aspect of the project I'm doing, or, or can you help guide me? I, I have this idea, but I'm not really quite sure how to do it. So um, that can fit in the office hours. And then Fridays can be that the formative type assessments that we talked about, the feedback yeah. can happen throughout the week. So I think it fits really well with it. Um, yeah. yeah. Aaron? I even, I think about, I think about at the middle school, high school level, you know, one of the things I want to empower kids to do that I don't think we do very well in education, it's my own opinion. I don't think we empower kids very well to set their own learning schedule. Mm -hmm. And I can see very much so what you're talking about, Chris, if we find ourselves in some kind of blended distance learning, that maybe it's time to sit down with kids and say, hey, you've got this incredible app on your phone. It's called a calendar. It's amazing. <laughs> and maybe you need to help as you are driving this project, what parts do you feel are best used in our time here face-to-face? -face? I'm here to support you. Mm -hmm. And what things do you think that maybe time at home when you have, if you have the internet and you have a device, what are the things you don't need somebody sitting around? for those inputs, outputs. And I love talking about inputs and outputs. What inputs do you want to have me here for? What outputs do I need to be here for? And what inputs and outputs can you do not in class? And have kids help to support that uh, as well. Sorry, Aaron, I didn't mean to step on you. I was just thinking no, about that as you was talking. Um, I was gonna say a couple of things. One is I like this method of planning units because it always forces me to have all of my stuff together before I even start the unit. I need yeah. to basically know what all of the texts are for my kids. Again, text meaning a variety of different types of things. I need to know not just what their final outcome will be, but what are the little things they're going to do along the way to practice for that and to process their learning. Um, and I think that methodology could be super helpful. I know that this spring, I just felt totally caught off guard by this whole thing as we all were. And I was just for the first few weeks, I was just kind of like scrambling to put choppy things out there. And I think it was very confusing. And then I ended up creating choice menus for each of my classes. And that completely eliminated the stress of the planning. And so, um, you know, it takes a few hours to put one of these units together. But once that's done, then it's all about finessing the learning with the students, giving lots of feedback, having conversations. The other thing that I was going to say is there's something to think about, um, you know, when you have um, a project, a larger output that students are going to create this authentic task, you kind of have to think about, especially in a distance learning context, is it something that the students are going to be building piece by piece throughout the mm. unit? Or is it something where they're practicing the skills they'll need for it throughout the unit, but then at the end of the unit is when they create it. And that could create point. dynamics. I think that um, if, if it's something that they're building throughout the unit, then during uh, distance or blended learning, it'd be really important to build in specific checkpoints for students. Um, and this is not to contradict what you said, Jeff, about students getting better at building their own calendar, particularly secondary students, um, but, but that we hold students to whatever calendar it is, whether it's ours or theirs, um, because a lot of kids have struggled with that during this time. If yeah. it's a, a situation where 
uh, they're going to be building the project through. Actually, either way, we just have to be really thoughtful about what are the best tools for checking in and for feedback. Um, I saw a great webinar that was geared around Canvas the other day, which is the learning management system that our district uses. And uh, this woman who teaches, she teaches math completely virtually, like she has for a while. Um, and she, she just has like a weekly form that her students fill out every week about what they learned, how the learning went, what they need next. And I thought, oh, duh, um, that's something I did not implement this spring, but would have been super easy. Not that all of mm -hmm. my students would have done it, but we have to, we have to get creative and, and more thoughtful about how we can have those touch points with our students to check in. But I, I certainly don't think that a unit like this is going to be, I don't think it's going to be unmanageably more challenging than teaching traditional instruction during a blended situation. And, and hopefully um, the driving question, the varied inputs and outputs, the authenticity of the task, hopefully those things are helpful in motivating students. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think it's important for kids to understand that due dates, I mean, we all have due dates, right? I mean, everybody has due dates, whether it's you have a due date to get your taxes in, you have a due date to, you know, renew your driver's license, and then you have due, date, due dates within your job. So I, I love that idea. Like, there are still dates that you must hit, but how you structure your time, how you use your time, we need to empower kids to figure that out and hold them to that. Say so here, you set your calendar and you thought you'd be on your second recording of your podcast or you thought you'd be this far into creating your thing and you're not. So it's not that you're punished at that point no. of getting a lower grade, but then you have an opportunity to say, okay, well, how are we going to adjust? All right, how are we going to adjust your time? You're now behind or you're ahead. How do we adjust your time so that you make sure that you hit your due date? And I think those are critical skills that we can teach kids by doing larger projects like this and then helping and supporting them in the process of the learning to be able to support them and through the process so that they know where are you at? How are you? And I love that idea of just even in a distance learning thing, checking in. What did you learn this week? How did that learning go? That is feedback, right? What do you need next from me? How can I help you next? Um, I think is a great question that we can ask kids to empower them to come to their teacher and say, this is what I need from you. Here's how, here's what I need from you. Um, and that empowers both of us and creates that relationship as well. So I love that idea. Um, I love it. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Um, I appreciate you giving us the time and energy uh, and things to look at. And Chris, do you want to talk about this last slide you had here in the slide? I do. We have some, we have a giveaway and some resources. So the resources are on the right. Uh, these are just, again, not, I mean, feed yourself, right? There are so many places out there and teachers doing project-based learning. These are just three that we found that we kind of like. Um, so those are resources, clickable links. The one on the left, this is actually our ebook that Aaron and I wrote, and we sold a few copies of it a few years back. Um, we are giving that away for free. So if you click on the link, it, you download it, it'll download as a PDF onto your device. So you have access to that. It, it's kind of what we talked about today, but it goes into a little more detail. So that's our gift awesome. to you. Yeah. And then our contact information is down there in the right hand corner. And Jeff, you drop the, the, spec, the tap. So they have access to all this? Yes, the link The link has been dropped yes, a couple perfect. times in the chat. Yep. It'll also be linked on uh, the show notes of the yep. podcast episode and next to the video when it gets uploaded too. So uh, thank you for giving away a free copy of the book. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's uh, yeah, that's great. And their, their contact information is there too. So if you want to, please feel free to reach out to Chris and Aaron. Uh, just more educators giving back to the greater good. I love it. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you for your time and energy and being here with us all today. Uh, appreciate it. This recording will be up on the Reimagine website. It'll be uploaded to YouTube. We will uh, link it into the Reimagine website on the resource page. And in a couple of weeks time, it'll be out on the podcast, Shifting Our Schools. So really appreciate that, uh, guys. So thanks so much for, for an hour with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, it. Jeff. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.